Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, everyone. My name is Diogo Geraldes, and I would like to welcome you to another yearly IMAKI webinar showcasing what is next for orthopedic engineering. This year, we are focusing on data-driven approaches, a very hot topic in medical devices and healthcare. As you know, we have packed a punchy two hours covering the whole life cycle of orthopedic devices from research and design through development into the deployment in the clinical setting. Feel free to ask the speakers any questions in writing. They will either answer it immediately after the talk or later in the chat. Our session will be split in two parts with a short break in the middle. Please stick around for what I envisage to be a great bird's eye view on what's happening uh, in this exciting field of orthopedics engineering. Without further ado, let me introduce you to our first speaker, Britt Barvelink. Uh, she's a clinical researcher from the Erasmus University in the Netherlands. She will be uh, talking about machine learning methods uh, and how it can help predict displacement in radius fractures in the clinical setting. Well, thank you, Diogo, for this introduction. I'll start sharing my screen and I hope you will all see my presentation. Um, well, yeah, I'm going to tell you something today about um, predicting redisplacement in uh, distal radius fractures. Um, as said, my name is Britt Barflink and I'm a clinical PhD candidate at the Erasmus Medical Center in Rotterdam, located in the Netherlands. And I will present this work on behalf of the Machine Learning Consortium, since I don't do this on my own. Um, it is my first time uh, speaking for an audience that is not clinicians. So um, I hope I can present this uh, in a clear way to you also. And otherwise I'll answer your questions uh, later on. I have nothing to disclose. And as said, I do this work together with the Machine Learning Consortium. Um, the Machine Learning Consortium is a large uh, collaborative network um, with people from all over the world, uh, from the USA, Australia to the Netherlands, um, England, and so on. Um, and we focus as consortium uh, on implementing machine learning in orthopedic trauma. Um, uh, my project, or the one that I'm uh, involved in, uh, typically focus on uh, wrist fractures. And the names you see here are the doctors and uh, computer technicians that are involved. Uh, we work together with uh, the University Medical Center in Groningen, um, the Erasmus Medical Center, where I work for, and the Australian Institute for Machine Learning. And these are the people that uh, really do the technical work for us. Uh, these are the our computer scientists. So um, a short introductory into wrist fractures. Wrist fractures, or actually complex wrist fractures, are the topic of my PhD. Um, and I'll start very simple. Over here, you see the radiographs of a healthy wrist. And um, when, a, when somebody breaks his arm, uh, you can end up with a wrist fracture, as you see uh, on the next pictures. Um, when, as a clinician, you see these radiographs on the emergency room, you are not happy because um, when you keep a fracture in this yeah, melanin um, situation, you will end up uh, with a very unhappy patient with a lot of uh, functional uh, complaints. So you have to fix this fracture. And the way we do this at the emergency room is first we apply traction to the wrist to get the bones uh, aligned again. Then we uh, manually, manually reduce the fracture. And afterwards, you, of course, want to keep this uh, anatomical alignment again. And therefore, we immobilize the fractures with a, a cost. Um, so when you look at the x-rays, uh, I just have on this slide, you first see the trauma uh, radiograph. It's a radiograph taken from the side. And you see that the wrist is not well aligned. The red line is bended backwards. Um, and you want to correct this alignment back into an anatomical position. So that's what happened after the reduction. You see that the line is quite horizontally again, and this is uh, anatomical. Unfortunately, a lot of uh, distal radius fractures, a lot of wrist fractures, will lose their threshold alignment during conservative treatment. So you have an ana anatomical position, but unfortunately, after a few weeks of cast immobilization, you end up with an X-ray like this and an unhappy patient. Unfortunately, we call this a uh, phenomenon fracture redisplacement. And unfortunately, this um, phenomenon happens quite often. Uh, actually, in 30 to 60 percent of all reduced wrist fractures, uh, a malalignment will, uh, will occur. 
And um, it is very hard for doctors to um, to uh, see in the beginning, uh, at, at, when you see the patient at your uh, uh, emergency room, if this fracture will end up uh, in a malaligned position after five weeks or that it will be stable. So that's the big question. Will the fracture remain stable or unstable during this conservative treatment? And because we are not that well in predicting redisplacement, uh, there's an emergent trend towards surgical fixation because doctors prefer to do it right uh, immediately. So then we prefer to uh, operatively, operatively treat these patients. So why do we need machine learning? Well, if we ask this question to a doctor, we, we often do this at conferences. I, I show doctors uh, three cases of wrist fractures and then I ask them which fracture will redisplace during five weeks of cast immobilization. Um, we are very bad in predicting this. Uh, so the idea of our consortium was to uh, see if um, machine learning can help us predict whether a fracture will redisplace or not. Um, before we started this research, we first wanted to find out or to objectify uh, clinicians' accuracy. And therefore, we conducted an online questionnaire and we sent out 20 case examples to these clinicians. Um, uh, so we sent out 20 radiographs of stable and unstable fractures. And we asked the surgeons that participated, which fracture uh, do you think will be stable and which will be unstable? Well, in the end, 160 um, uh, surgeons participated in this uh, questionnaire and uh, their accuracy in predicting redisplacement was actually quite worse. It was only 54%. So it's like flipping a coin. Uh, we are not good in predicting redisplacement. And that's why um, our study aim was to develop a machine learning model that can accurately predict instability of wrist fractures by only looking at trauma and post-reduction radiographs. So um, machine learning, <clears throat> for you, I think it's a piece of a cake. You're the first audience that probably don't need a lot of explanation about this topic. But for this um, a model, we use a convolutional neural network structure. Um, and when I explain convolutional neural networks to clinicians, I always uh, end up with this example that we try to mimic our human brain uh, that is able to make uh, predictions based on pattern recognition. So, for example, when we want to make a, a CNN that is able to distinguish cats from dogs, we first, of course, need to give the computer lots of labeled cases. So we tell the computer this picture concerns a cat, this picture concerns a dog. And then after training the CNN, you can then test the CNN with a new case that is unlabeled and then the computer will give you its uh, um, uh, prediction. So that's what we did uh, with developing this, uh, this model as well. The difficult thing in uh, clinical research is uh, that it's quite hard to uh, collect lots of uh, patient data. Um, and that's the good thing about our machine learning consortium. We are able to collect radiographs from diff different centers. In this case, uh, we collected radiographs in two university medical centers in the ne Netherlands. And then we selected radiographs, or we selected cases that were treated primarily conservative, so no operations, and that fractures that had an acceptable fracture alignment after a reduction. Then we labeled these cases and we ended up with uh, almost 500 wrist fractures of which uh, 350 were stable and 150 were unstable. So then we trained the model, uh, of course, and um, so what's the accuracy of our model? We know that doctors have an accuracy of 54%, which is not that good. Our model had an accuracy of 76%. So in other words, in 76% of cases, our model is accurate about its prediction, whether the fracture uh, he sees uh, on trauma and post-reduction radiographs is stable or not. This is a very promising result uh, for us um, because this machine learning model uh, can really help doctors already at the emergency by making its prediction. But we're not yet there. Um, we want to cross this magically 80% uh, line, of course, uh, and therefore we uh, are still optimizing its performances. First of all, we added uh, some patient demographics, for example, uh, age and uh, sex. But unfortunately, this didn't really um, optimize our model. Um, 
then of course we want to externally validate uh, our model on a prospective cohort. The good thing is we already have this prospective cohort. So as soon as we uh, are <clears throat> happy about our accuracy, we can immediately test it uh, on this uh, external cohort. And another um, challenge for us is to implement our machine learning model in clinical systems. Um, and this will probably take some time, but we're already um, working on this with our radiology department so that as soon as we're happy about our, our model, we can implement it in our system and um, to try if this really helps doctors with their predictions. The last thing we want to do, what we're working on right now uh, to, um, to make our model more accurate is adding landmarks to our model because we know that uh, our model now focus on the fracture area. Well, when we decide if a fracture is acceptably aligned or not, we uh, pay very much interest in, in the red dots you see over here. It's, it's called the, 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 the articular surface of the wrist. It's the most important region for a patient to have uh, good functionality. So we try to uh, take uh, or, algorithm, or algorithm to look at these uh, dots a little bit more as it does right now. And these results will come soon. Uh, I hoped it would be there already before this presentation, but unfortunately, I cannot uh, tell you this right now. So to end up, uh, our model right now has an accuracy of 76%, which is a lot better than, uh, than doctors have right now. And in this way, um, uh, this model can help doctors with personalized risk estimation already at the emergency room to decide together with the patient whether it would be smart to uh, surgically fixate the fracture or start with conservative treatment. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, such a nice presentation. It's a great example on how collaboration between computer scientists, engineers, and um, clinicians uh, can lead to, to improvements in healthcare. And uh, it's nice to see that it's a multinational collaboration too. Uh, I have a couple of questions for you. One is about um, the training data set. So training data set is important for, um, for uh, obviously uh, the accuracy of your model, uh, but to my understanding, uh, the type quality of images and the type of images uh, the, var vary greatly between uh, centers because each has their own protocol, orientation of x-rays, etc. How do you deal with that? Well, yeah, thank you for that question. Um, it is indeed very important that you have a, a varied uh, training set. It would be best if we, uh, um, if you have X-rays from uh, different centers. Right now, we have X-rays from two centers, which is already quite good for clinical research. Uh, but we could expand this with uh, with our uh, with the test set, with the set we have for external validation right now. Uh, but when we look to the uh, variation in between these two centers, it was quite small, um, since radiographs of the wrists are actually always taken in, in the same positions. Uh, you always have a poster anterior uh, uh, x-ray and a, a lateral x-ray. So there's not that much variation in between these um, in, the, in between these centers. Okay, that's great. And um, going forward, how do you determine, uh, how do you demonstrate the benefit of the technique? I know you've mentioned it's about 50% more accurate, 76 versus 54, but, uh, yeah. but introduce it in a clinical setting, you have to take in consideration cost, obviously accuracy, and also the reluctance of clinicians to delegate the decision making to, to, to machines. So uh, have you defined a cutoff on how you're gonna approach that? That's a very interesting question as well, because uh, doctors can be quite arrogant, of course, if, especially when they're uh, uh, when they have a lot of uh, um, when they work for a very long time already, they they know what they do and they think they're right. Uh, but I think with with the uh, questionnaire we sent out, we already showed that um, that doctors are not that that uh, accurate as they might think they are. And of course, it's not our idea that this um, CNN uh, completely takes over their decision making. Uh, that's the most important uh, part to um, to tell these doctors. It's, it's not that the computer decides what they should do. It, it's just uh, an aid for them to, um, to show patients um, in a visual way 
uh, what the chance is that their fracture will redisplace. Um, and yeah, it's not that they should totally rely on it, but yeah, we trained this model already on 500 cases. I think there are not a lot of, um, especially not young uh, orthopedic surgeons uh, that already have seen 500 cases. So in this way, it should really be supportive. Great, thank you very much, uh, Britt, for, for such a great presentation. If you have any more questions for Britt, please write them in the chat. We will be more than happy uh, to answer them uh, in writing. Uh, so thank you. Our thank next speaker you. is Harry Rosidis. Uh, he's technical lead from RADI uh, Devices. He will be telling us how AI can be applied to prosthetic socket design with direct implications for patients. Thank you, Diogo, for this introduction. And thank you to the IMAQ for inviting us to give this talk about data-driven approaches to prosthetic socket design. Radio Devices was founded in 2020 as a spin-out of the University of Southampton, the bioengineering group. Our goal is to enable the quality of life for prosthetic uh, for, for body interfacing uh, devices users. And this can be prosthetic uh, uh, devices for limbs, ventilator masks, carrying aids, earbuds, etc. We do so by leveraging historical data to improve fitting with evidence-based evidence methods. My name is Harry. I am an engineer by training. I studied uh, electrical and computer engineering at the National Technical University of Athens. And then I proceeded to do a PhD in bioengineering, focusing on 3D X-ray imaging. I joined Radii Devices in 2021, and I'm currently leading the technical efforts of the team. Well, there are 170 million people with amputation nowadays worldwide, and they would all benefit from a well-fitting prosthesis. This is composed of a prosthetic socket at the top, and then apparatus, a mechanical apparatus at the bottom. At the bottom, and its main goal is to replace the function of a lost limb. If this prosthetic socket is not designed well, it can cause pain and injury, and even become completely uh, unusable for the user. Uh, for the entire prosthesis. The design process of prosthetic sockets at the moment greatly depends on the expertise of clinicians called the prosthetists. And it is a process that produces a custom-made socket for each patient that takes up to nine repeated visits until a good fit is achieved. So how does this workflow look like? A traditional workflow, uh, you start off with a method to capture the residual limb shape. For the traditional workflow, you can use plaster to do so, whereas digital workflows uh, can use 3D scanners to digitize the surface of the residual limb. Then you uh, you start. Then you need to rectify the shape of the original residual limb in order to load tolerant areas and offload areas with sensitivity. For the traditional workflow, this means carving the plaster at places where you want to apply load or adding material where you want to offload the pressure. In the uh, digital case, this can be done by modifying the 3D surface mesh using computer-aided design software. Once you are happy with your final design for the socket, you can uh, fabricate it one way or another. And then by attaching the mechanical apparatus, we end up having the final prosthesis. So we see that both traditional and digital workflows are greatly similar, and they are both solely reliant upon the prosthetist expertise for the socket design step. Uh, step. A key difference here is that unlike the traditional workflow, in the digital case, you don't get rid 
of your scans after the prosthesis has finished. So those data stick around and they have actually been accumulating over the years. So the question becomes, how can we use this accumulating data in order to empower and support the fitting process? Well, the research community has asked this question for quite a while now, and it has long been acknowledged that there is a rich amount of information in this digital data that can inform the design process for the prosthetic sockets. These techniques involve looking at the volume enclosed by the surface and even the shape deviation. However, it's one thing to design an academic uh, process and another thing to make it available to the end user. So the clinical uptake is quite a key here. One reason for the lack of uptake, no, uptake is the lack of software tools that would make these technologies available for clinical practice. And this is where Radii steps in. Our goal is to make use of this vast amount of historical data and make them available at the fingertips of the experts. So we start off by taking a pair of residual limb and the design socket from a historical database. And the first thing that you need to do with that pair is to uh, match the two surfaces up, so alignment. What we are after is this image on the right. We call this the rectification map, which is a measure of distance between the two surfaces at each position along the surface. You can do so following several methods but it can only be relevant for prosthetic socket design if anatomical information is taken into account for the alignment. And so we do, we do this by asking the clinician to provide us a couple of anatomical landmarks. Here, the mid patella tendon and the distal tibia, which we then use to align the two surfaces and then compute the rectification map. Right, so once we have the two surfaces being aligned, we can already start doing some analysis on them and extracting useful information. What we see here is scans from a single participant taken over one month intervals. We start off by taking cross sections at the, from the distal end all the way up to the this mid padella tendon, which are shown here on the horizontal axis and then computing the perimeter of those cross sections and putting them on the vertical axis. If we focus on the red line here, we see that this cross section perimeter increases in a non-linear way. And this can already tell us something about the volume enclosed by the surface. Of course, what's more important here is tracking the volume loss over time. We, we go from the red line all the way to the deep blue line for, uh, for incremental points in time. And we observe that the volume decreases, the, the soft tissue disappears from the amputated limb. And this kind of analysis is already being useful to support in insurance claims with hard data. As you can imagine, a socket that was designed for time point one will not be suitable anymore for further times in point in in time further points in time since the limb shape has changed right but uh, where these technologies become really useful really interesting is when you can teach the computer to understand a bit more about the surface that it is represented and this becomes available by modeling. We develop a statistical shape model for these kind of surfaces that tries to reduce this or original surface that has 30 or maybe 60,000 data points down to, a hand, down to a handful of modes as they are called here. In this model, the first mode will represent the length of the surface. The second mode will be how bulbous it is, a deduction, a reduction, and so on and so forth. So we have applied this model 
in clinical in a clinical on a clinical data set from the UK, and uh, studied the two prevailing design styles, namely the total surface bearing and the padella tendon bearing for prosthetic sockets in clinical practice today. And what we found out, interestingly, is that these two apparently dissimilar design styles are not really two facets of a coin, but they are they rather sit on a continuum, one fading into each other. So what this tells us what is that uh, how we can gain some insight of even current trends in clinical practice by looking at a more structured way to represent our data. So you might say, okay, you have this nice model. How can you make it useful for the clinical practice rather than just looking at historical data? Well, it becomes useful when a new patient comes in, we scan their residual limb, and then we represent that limb with uh, that particular statistical shape model. We then feed it into an expert system that tries to predict how a, a well-fitting socket would look like given the data it has seen before from the historical data bank. In our system, this uh, takes the form of uh, smart templates. These are annotations on, on top of the surface um, that make a suggestion about the shape and the rectification amount for each rectification that has to be made. Of course, these are adjustable. The, we ask the expert to adjust and fine tune the original suggestion until they are happy with the final result. This closes the loop, of course, and we can keep training our model and even create a bespoke model for the particular uh, prosthetists to capture how they prefer to design their own sockets. But I am really hiding a key question here. How do you know how well a socket is fitting? Well, historically, what's called patient recorded outcome measures or prompts have been used uh, to do so. Basically, you will design a socket, give it to the person with amputation, and ask how well it fits. They will then give you an answer from zero to 10, let's say, which as you can imagine is greatly subjective and uh, it can also be biased by psychological factors such as trauma, which is common post amputation. So how can we improve this kind of uh, quantification of the quality of the socket surface? Well, we can introduce new sources of data for instance, what we call here tissue coverage, or what is called in the platform as rich limb data, um, is a kind of annotation on top of the rich uh, of the limb surface that will tell you something about how sensitive the tissue is at that point, where is places you would like to offload, or whether the the surface is bony at that at a certain area where it's placed that you can apply more pressure. Of course, we don't have to stop on uh, prosthetic sockets either. Uh, we can go on and look at pressure profiles between the lib and the socket surface. And this can already inform the, the socket design to optimize for a particular pressure distribution, but it can also give us some research insights. Or for example, we can look at the lip shape change over time, as I've shown in the previous slide, and try to predict an optimal time for a new socket to be designed, or even support insurance reimbursement claims with hard data. Right, so to sum up, I have really just scratched the surface of what we can do by extracting information from historical data but I hope that you got a feeling of where the industry is going. What is key is that we pack these capabilities into a useful tool and make them available to the experts to support and empower their work. Because what in, what's matters in there is that patients can really benefit from scientific and technological progress. With this, I would like to conclude 
Thank you, uh, Diogo, for uh, chairing the session. Thank the IMECI for inviting us to give this talk. Uh, thank all of our collaborators and supporters shown here, and thank you for listening. Thank you, Harry, for such an interesting uh, talk. I have a couple of questions uh, for you. The first one is, how is um, the haptic experience of plaster technicians captured with, uh, with this technique? Pardon? So usually prosthetic socket design is done, uh, is done by experienced plaster and cast, casting technicians. Who, who know when to adapt and, and how, how tight it is and how uh, loose it may be with massive uh, impact in, in patient comfort. How, how do you, this, can this technique capture that type of experience? This is a very interesting question. Okay, so you can use a haptic device in order to try and capture, make it more intuitive for the cl clinician to digitize this kind of surface. But at the moment, uh, we simply capture the, the surface shape. You can then uh, attach annotations of that surface shape because in, uh, in addition to the 3D shape, you also get information about color. And so that, that can be used for uh, manual marking of areas that, uh, where the user would like to apply pressure, for instance and that can be fed into the system as metadata, added information uh, further to the actual shape. Great. Uh, we have another question from the public. This one is, um, are these periodical patient data collected as part of a clinical pathway? And if not, then what needs to be done uh, to further increase accessibility of such technology? The the current clinical practice in the UK is quite mixed. You have independent clinics that work as private, um, in a private manner, and you have also clinics that collaborate with the NHS. So uh, the standard clinical pathway is not really dictating whether you use a digital workflow or a plaster, plaster workflow or even a hybrid workflow where you can start off with plaster and scan the plaster cast. So that's pre-modified uh, in some sense. So um, we currently collaborate with a major private uh, clinician provider to utilize their own data set, which is what they um, capture over time and make make the data set available to us. But this is not really regularized, regulated uh, in any way at the moment. Great. Uh, thank you very much. There are a couple of questions in the chat. Harry will happily uh, answer them in writing after this. Uh, but thank you, Harry, for such a great uh, uh, talk. Um, thank you again. Yeah. And uh, to finish the first half of the webinar in style, we have Claudia Lindner, Sir Henry Dale, Senior Research Fellow at the University of Manchester, discussing how computers can aid the analysis of imaging data in the diagnosis and management of musculoskeletal disorders. Thank you very much for the introduction and also for inviting me to speak here today about our research. So in my work, I do a lot on developing tools and methods to automatically extract information uh, from medical images with a particular focus on uh, extracting information from X-ray in images linked to uh, various musculoskeletal disorders. So how do we extract this information from the images? Uh, for these purposes, we've developed a machine learning based technology that is integrated into our bone finder software. And what that basically does, it locates feature points or landmark points. So just to give you an example, in um, this 
uh, for this image here, uh, we've loaded a model to automatically outline the proximal femur using 65 points, and the model just goes away uh, and does what it's been trained to do. Now, in terms of how the uh, technology works, in the interest of time, I'm not going into too much detail because I really want to focus on uh, some of the applications which um, are relevant to musculoskeletal conditions in, in orthopedics in particular. Uh, but just to give you a quick overview, the um, underlying system's got two main steps. The first step is what we refer to as the global search. And this is where the system uh, proposes a number of candidates for the position, orientation and scale of the object of interest. And in this particular case, uh, we are interested in, in the knee joint. And based on this, we then apply what we call the local search. And here we use um, random forest regression routing in the constraint locomotive framework. And what that means is that each of our points has got their own little model. So each point looks what learns what the area around that point looks like. So that then when we apply the system to a new unseen image, those little models make predictions on where they think those points should be placed. And then we combine these predictions with some learned shape information from the training data. So this is really just the, the approach in, in a nutshell. Uh, and just to also give you some indication on how well it works. So we've applied this technology to a whole range of uh, skeletal structures, uh, including uh, images from adults as well as children's images as well. And beyond X-rays, we've also been using it for different imaging modalities, uh, such as DEXA images. And so when we assess the performance of the technology to automatically outline structures, we use a metric that uh, we refer to as point to curve error. And that basically is the distance between uh, an automatically located point position and a curve fitted through the relevant ground truth uh, points for that particular image. And what we found across application areas really is that we uh, achieve a mean image point to curve error of within one millimeter for 90 to 100 percent of images, depending on, on the data set uh, we are working on and also depending on uh, how much data we've got available to train the system. Now, this is a particular focus on, on outlining structures, but it's uh, the underlying technology. It's not an edge detector, so it's all about feature points. And just to give you a couple of examples uh, where we're looking for individual features. So on the left, bottom left, you can see an image, a lateral image of the sky. That is something that is used in, in orthodontics and dentistry to plan and assess treatments. And then on the right, I've added an image of the hand where we are interested in looking for, for the joints of the hand. So that, that's the system that we've got in place to um, automatically extract the information from the images, which in, in the first instance, are a number of point positions, which will vary depending on the uh, clinical application area. So what can you do with these point positions? And so the first application area I'd like to focus on here is that you can use these point positions to automatically generate geometric measurements. And I'd like to give you some uh, example studies where we've been using this. So this first one here was work done in collaboration with UMC Utrecht and the lead was William Paul Gillis. And here we aim to estimate um, the hip knee ankle angle from the femoral tibia angle in standard knee value graphs. So we had a rather small data set of just 110 image pairs, but we were fortunate for, the, for these patients to have both a standard knee value graph as well as a full limb body graph. Um, we also had uh, manually taken measurements of uh, femoral tibia angle and hip knee ankle angle uh, for these image pairs. And then we've, as part of the study, we've developed a bone finder model to outline structures of the knee. So you can see that on that uh, first image here, so the red outline with the black dots, that is the uh, automatic outline that was generated by our bone finder system. And then we use these automatically located points to calculate the uh, femoral tibia angle in the standard knee radiographs. Now, in terms of results, uh, we found that there's a high correlation between the femoral tibia angle and the hip knee angle angle, uh, with Pearson correlation and ICC values around 0.9. And that was the same when we used the automatically calculated femoral tibia angle rather than the manual ground truth. And in terms of the mean absolute error between the predicted hip knee ankle angle from the standard radi knee radiographs and the ground truth uh, measurements from the full limb radiographs, we achieved an error value of about 1.8 degrees. 
Uh, a second example on automatically generating measurements uh, is this one here, which was done in collaboration with so Sofort Roy NHS Foundation Trust and East Lancashire Hospital NHS Trust, uh, working with uh, Joshua Lauder. And here the goal was to see whether we can develop a system to automatically assess foot collapse on lateral weight bone foot radiographs. And there were three particular measurements that we were interested in, the uh, Mary's angle, Kakini tick, and Cupid height, as shown in the image on the, on the top. And so we had, in the study, we had 200 images of uh, from a total of 79 subjects. And for each of these 200 images, we also had these three measurements uh, manually taken by five clinical experts. So what we did in the study is we developed a, a bone finder model to outline key features of the foot that are relevant to taking these measurements as shown in, in the bottom image. And what we found is that our automatically generated measurements were statistically in agreement with the um, manually taken clinical expert measurements. And just to, to visualize these results, I've got these additional plots here, where on the left, we've got cubit height in the middle, cocaine tilt, and then Mary's angle on the right. And the x-axis of these plots are the images. And then the colorful lines in the columns uh, represent the spread of the manual annotations per image. And then I hope you can see the black dots, which represent the um, automatic results of our system. And I hope you can appreciate that um, our system uh, did well in terms of predicting measurements which are within the spread of the manual uh, clinical expert measurements. Now, just a, a final example in terms of how we can use these point positions for uh, generating useful uh, clinical measurements is uh, this last example here, which is work done in collaboration with Order Hay Students and NHS Foundation Trust in the University of Liverpool. And uh, our local leader on this is Peter Thompson. And here we are aiming to develop a software system to uh, diagnose and monitor orthopedic diseases in children. And in this particular study, we were interested in automatically measuring um, rhinos migration percentage, percentage in acetabular index, uh, as shown in the image um, on the left. And again, uh, we've developed a, a relevant bone finder model, as you can see on the images on the right, which are capturing parts of the pelvis as well as the proximal femur uh, across different ages of development. And so we had a total of 450 um, radiographs uh, in this study, and a subset of 50 of these images, we also had measured the uh, acetabular index and thymus migration percentages by nine clinical experts. Now, in terms of results, uh, I was uh, suggest that our fu fully automatic measurements based on the uh, point positions identified by bone finder were statistically in agreement with clinical experts. And again, these plots are very similar to the ones that you've seen for the previous study, is that the um, x-axis are the images and then the colorful dots is the variation of the uh, manual clinical expert measurements. And in this case, the uh, red crosses are the uh, results of our fully automatic system. And we've got the uh, acetabular index measurement on the left and then the Ramsey migration percentage measurement on the right. And again, just visually this suggests that our system uh, is in agreement with the clinical experts, but then also if we statistically validate that, we find high agreement and we can also evidence that there isn't any bias in the automatic measurements that we are generating. And we've then also validated uh, this technology in an in independent application stat, uh, study on an additional 400 tips, which were each measured by five clinical experts. And again, it's a very similar picture, um, acetabular index on the left, runs migration percentage on the right, where our automatic systems are in agreement with the manual clinical expert uh, measurements. And again, there's no bias uh, from the automatic system. So this is one... Uh, direct application on how you can use the point positions. Another way on how you can use the point positions is to use them to what we call automatic shape and appearance analysis. And we've also already heard in the um, previous presentation about statistical shape models, but just for you that aren't familiar with this, I just want to just add a couple of sentences on this. So what we're doing for statistical shape models is we're basically taking the point positions that we have uh, have identified the bone finder and apply principal component analysis to identify the main modes of variation. And to visualize that, that gives you something like this. So on the left, you can see uh, the main mode of variation of the proximal femur model uh, of over 750 hips. And then the, the right one is the second 
main variation across the data set and you get more and more modes depending on how much variation you want to explain overall. But the key for us really here is that this gives you a way to quantify the overall shape. So I, I hope you can appreciate if you look at geometric measurements, uh, you just can't quite a lot of information of the structure you're looking at. And so statistical shape models give us a way to quantify the overall shape of an object in an image. And we can go beyond shape and also include the texture values and then combine shape and texture into what we call appearance values. And these are then really just give you um, quantitative variables that you can use for any kind of analysis for looking, for example, into differences between groups. Now, uh, the first example I'd like to, to give for this one is this one here. Uh, again, this was a study in collaboration with Jung Siotrich, led by William Paul Gillis. And here the goal was to see whether we can predict radiographic hypocephritis or total hip replacement within an eight year follow up period. And uh, this time we had a bone finder model that was outlining the proximal femur as well as parts of the pelvis. And we applied that to uh, 1140 subjects and then generated a statistical shape model, a statistical shape model, where you can see two of the modes represented by the uh, colorful pictures in the middle. And in addition to the images for this study, we also had clinical information, so we had demographic information for the patients, we had clinic examination data, and also uh, basic uh, clinical radiographic parameters, such as uh, information on osteophytes and joint space narrowing. And so here we built three different prediction models, uh, one just based on the clinical parameters, which achieved, achieved an error under the curve of 0.8. Uh, a second one, which just used the shape modeling parameters, which had a very similar performance with an error under the curve of 0.8. Uh, but then we found actually that the two information are complementary. So by combining the clinic information with the information automatically derived from the images, we could boost the performance to an error under the curve, curve of 0.86. And just to highlight the, the potential workflow of such a system, so that means you, you would have your uh, image in clinical practice, then you would have a computer-aided system which outlines the structure of interest and then generates some kind of quantitative measurement. In this study, it was what called the shape score. You can then combine this with other data that might already be available in clinical practice and use this to then either uh, predict potential disease onset or monitor disease progression or assess uh, treatment efficacy. Now, another example on using a uh, statistical uh, shape uh, and appearance models is this one here, where we work with Order Hayes Children's Hospital and the University of Liverpool, and the study was led by Aidan Davison. And here we uh, developed a tool to automatically identify whether a child is suffering from leg calf perthes disease based on the hip radiograph. Again, we developed a bone finder model, in this case to outline uh, the proximal femur in radiographs of children's hips. And then we used the automatically located point positions to uh, build statistical shape and appearance models. And what we found here is that we're actually using the shape information, we achieved a very high accuracy with an error under the curve of uh, 0.98 to be able to uh, distinguish between uh, healthy hips and hips that are affected by leg calf perthes disease. Now, just a very quick one uh, comment on this one. So this is very recent work by our PhD student Max Desanger in collaboration with Salford Roy NHS Foundation Trust. And here he's looking into whether images that are currently uh, classified as looking normal in, in clinical practice, whether there's any information in these images that we're not currently seeing or not currently measuring that might indicate whether patients uh, might go on and develop a condition that's called charcoal foot and the very early results have suggest that there is something in the images that the uh, current clinical uh, measurements that are being applied are, are not uh, capturing. So there's more, more information on that to come um, in the future as we get more results on this. So just to summarize, I'd like to bring back this image that we've seen before. And so I hope you've seen that it's not just about hips, it could be a kind of any kind of structure that we could apply this technology to. Uh, it could also include implants if you wanted to look at post-operative images, and then you could automatically generate these shape scores or texture scores or geometric measurements, which in combination with other information that might already be available in clinical practice to help you to um, assess and monitor and diagnose musculoskeletal uh, conditions. And so machine learning technologies uh, such as bone filter really just enable uh, this type of automated image assessment uh, for patient benefit. And I'd just like to finish by saying that the bone finder models that we're developing as part of these studies are all freely available for research purposes. I'd like to thank all my collaborators, co-authors uh, and funders for their support. And thank you very much for listening.
Thank you very much for such a, a great talk, Claudia. Um, I have a couple of questions uh, for you. One is about, well, uh, Bone Finder and what you... Uh, uh, I think you're there, so I will close the phone, okay? Uh, yeah, a bone finding what you showed, uh, it shows great results in TD, but I wonder whether it will be, um, uh, ever, if you have any plans of using 3D measurements. Sorry, they were repeating that. Put me here now. Sorry, uh, I, I'm going to say it again. Uh, uh, you, you show that bone finding has great results for 2D measurements uh, of X rays, and I wonder if you have plans in. in extrapolating that for 3D in the future? Okay. Yeah, so we do we do have the technology in 3D um, as well. Uh, a lot of our studies are in 2D, mainly because that's the, the data that we get from the from the clinics. And I guess part of it is also that uh, we always really need the manual ground truth uh, to, to develop the systems, but also to assess the performance of the systems and to uh, get the clinical input that on this. I mean, it's, you know, it's very time consuming to get it in 2D, but it'd be even more time consuming to get that data in 3D. But the technology itself, that is available in 3D um, as well. Great. And I have a follow-up question, which is about children who, who have a lot of cartilage and not as much bone. And uh, how can this tool be further developed? To, one, how do you get it? What challenges do you find when you're actually looking at uh, pediatric uh, skeletons? But also, uh, how, how can this tool be further developed to also using that knowledge to then be used in, in soft tissue measurements uh, for adult patients too? Um, so, yes, so the, the development of stages that they are affecting, mainly the variation of what you can see in the images. So we've done some pediatric work in, in hips, as you've seen, but also in, in hands. And it's we find that our technology works very well if you give it the sufficient data. So the key here really is to have representative data in your training data. So if you capture the um, amount of variation that the system is likely to encounter uh, later on, then the system works quite well in terms of uh, taking that into account. And I guess the other bit to consider there is when you develop your what we call the annotation model, so that are these specific point positions, to be aware of how do these structures change over time and to place the kind of the points uh, accordingly. So you don't want to have um, locations that kind of are disappearing over time, but it's fine for things to change and deform basically. Um, in terms of soft tissue structures, so it's not it's not exclusively for bones. So we've also done some work, for example, on lungs. So it's any kind of of structures really. Um, there's some very early work in terms of looking at um, ultrasound images as, as well. And um, so yeah, it's it, it's very flexible, and you, you could use it for soft tissue if you, if if you do have the data available. Thank you very much. Uh, I know my colleagues at uh, Imperial College use Bone Finder, uh, so we're very thankful for your work and a uh, great way to close this half, which has been a great half. And I'm looking forward to our next to listening for our next three speakers after the short break. We'll be back in eight minutes at two p.m. GMT. So see you soon.
Okay, so we're going to start with the second half of the session. Thank you very much, first of all, for all the speakers in the first half. And it was, it was a really nice discussion and question and answers there as well. Um, so just uh, to, to, to remind you, if you have any questions uh, throughout the talks, please post them in the chat in the box. And we will try to prioritize and answer them as we go through. So some of the questions, if we have time, I will ask the speakers um, directly. And uh, if we don't have any time, then the speakers will be able to engage with you and answer the questions um, through, during, during um, the other talks or in, using the chat. OK, so. Um, our next speaker is uh, Elsa Jonkus, a professor at, um, at the University of Kyiv, and she'll be talking about, she's the head of the Human Movement Biomechanics Research Group, and she'll be talking about science beyond experimental measurements, where simulation meets clinical questions. Over to you, Elsa. Thank you very much for the introduction and also thank you for giving me uh, the opportunity to give the presentation titled Science Beyond Experimental Measures Where Simulations Meet Clinical Questions. However, in light of the title of the seminar, in hindsight, it might have been more appropriate if I had formulated the title as... Sorry, my animation is not coming up. Well, where simulations meet clinical data. So to understand the cause of movement disorders, integrated 3D motion capture offers an enormous potential to objectively describe the patient's gait dysfunction in terms of joint angles and moments in different planes, as well as the underlying muscle coordination strategy as reflected in surface EMG measurements. So as a result, clinical gait analysis is a well-accepted technology for defining therapeutic goal, goal setting in complex orthopedic conditions, for example, like cerebral palsy, and also for longitudinal follow-up of the functional outcome. The therapeutic ambitions are often formulated in terms of normalization of the gait pattern or even normalization of musculoskeletal loading. However, if we make claims that our treatment goal is to normalize musculoskeletal loading, this requires the use of physics-based models and simulation tools to have access to these parameters. It brings us to a basic question highly relevant for the seminar of today. Why would you use physics-based models if you can measure it was a question our clinical radiologist would repeatedly ask me. I will now present to you my rationale and give you some examples on how I think physics-based modeling can make a difference in clinical practice and research. So in our research on musculoskeletal disorders, we use physics-based models to integrate different patient characteristics and to evaluate their effect on musculoskeletal loading. Indeed, information on the movement, the musculoskeletal geometry, muscle strength, material properties, and even biological responses can be used to personalize different model parameters. As a result, we can then explore their individual effect on musculoskeletal loading at a joint and also tissue level. These insights are then translated into clinical decision making or drive fundamental research insight on musculoskeletal mechanobiology. Musculoskeletal models entail a mathematical description of the musculoskeletal system. Some of these models are generic. That means that they are representative for the average adult subject and that they are then scaled to fit the patient's anthropometry based on, for example, 3D motion capture data. For patients with known musculoskeletal deformities, information from medical images can be integrated. In our work on knee loading in OA, we update the geometry of the cartilage surfaces of the complex knee model based on 3D MRI images to account for the effect of articular surface geometry on the contact pressures in the joint during locomotion. Once we have personalized our musculoskeletal model, 
We couple then the 3D marker coordinates and the ground reaction forces to the model to obtain the different um, degrees of freedom in the model. Using a dedicated static optimization procedure, we then solve the muscle force distribution underlying the observed gait pattern. Based on this, we can then calculate the joint contact forces as indicated by the green arrow pointing from the knee and even the contact pressures in the joint. Here you see the changes in magnitude and location of the contact pressure during gait pattern. My group uses these physics-based models to generate insights on the relation between joint movement and loading in knee OA in order to define in silico informed biomarkers for early OA and OA progression and to customize rehabilitation programs. I will show you our recent findings. Indeed, knee OA is a complex degenerative process in which mechanical loading is implicated. In literature, the knee adduction moment or the CAM that evaluates the alignment of the ground reaction force to the knee center in the frontal plane was confirmed as a parameter that was sensitive to the presence of knee OA in the end stage of the disease process. However, its role in the onset and early stages of the disease is more variable. So when evaluating the CAM and the resultant knee contact forces shown here at the um, left and on the right, in a group of early OA patients indicated in blue, we could not see any significant differences to control subjects. This means that in the early phases of the disease process, where there is no structural changes on the radiographs, there are no local changes in the um, joint loading present. We only found significant differences in, in the knee contact forces in end stage OA patients, indicated here in the animation as the higher um, arrow indicative of higher contact loading and also more medial oriented contact loading. But this was only different in patients who are about to undergo total knee replacement surgery. However, when using our more complex musculoskeletal modeling workflow, the medial compartment loading was already significantly different and increased in the early disease process, confirming its potential role as a biomarker to identify early OA patients based on the gait characteristics, even prior to the onset of structural changes on the radiographs. Furthermore, the location of the contact pressure in the joint was shifted, hinting at the role of joint instability that we will now try to further explore. Even more important, in a secondary analysis of a prospective cohort that we followed, we identified altered compartmental loading to be only present at baseline in patients that would show structural disease progression over a period of two-year follow-up. Here you see that at baseline, not only medial compartment loading magnitude, but also, again, the loading location was significantly different in the group of progressors and non-progressors compared to controls thereby confirming medial compartment loading as a functional biomarker that is sensitive to disease progression. We also used model-based insights to identify staged rehabilitation strategies for knee OA based on a quantification of the compartmental knee loading rather than the clinician's preference. Based on the physics-based modeling, presented before, we were able to produce a joint loading map that indicates how for different therapeutic exercises, different zones of the articular surface are incrementally loaded. Such an analysis allows the physical therapist to rank exercise intensity 
For instance, with respect to walking, surprisingly, squatting and stair ascent were classified as providing less loading to the tibiofemoral joint and could be introduced earlier in the rehabilitation process. Likewise, we were able to identify exercises that loaded more the medial or the lateral condyle, which allows us tailoring exercise programs for patients with either medial or lateral OA involvement. These are some examples of our work that show that in the orthopedic treatment of musculoskeletal conditions, physics-based simulations can be useful in providing additional insights relevant to the clinical decision-making process. Therefore, I advocate that when attempting personalized medicine in orthopedic conditions, it is recommended to supplement more classical clinical data with simulation-based parameters as supplementary input for AI applications, or to train the black box AI-based technique to constraints imposed by the physics-based model. Of course, such an approach is liable to specific challenges. For instance, if we make the claim that we aim to document the knee loading landscape and identify how it relates to anatomical features or gait patterns in knee OA patient populations, our current samples are relatively limited and only sparsely sample the data space. Expanding our data set is limited by two evident challenges. Our current modeling approach relies on high fidelity lab-based and medical imaging data, which is liable to high cost. Therefore, in our current work, we propose to use population-based modeling techniques in which we create synthetic input data that is within the variability defined by the sparse population samples. For the movement characteristics, we use principal component analysis to synthesize the 3D movement characteristics that explain the largest variability in the gait pattern and evaluate how they impact compartmental knee loading in the knee OA population. For the anatomy, we exploit the use of statistical shape modeling approaches to account for the geometrical variability seen in our knee OA population. By integrating these dominant geometrical features in our musculoskeletal modeling pipeline, in addition to applying the population-based motion characteristics, we can then generate synthetic data sets and evaluate the sensitivity of knee loading to either anatomical features versus movement patterns. This brings me back to my discussion with the clinical radiologists. As a group, we are convinced that our physics-based modeling approach holds additional value for the field of orthopedics, as we model the unmeasurable and predict the unpredictable. I hope that I have been able to convince you to also consider physics-based modeling parameters. This is where I want to thank my collaborators and funding bodies and you for your attention. Please feel free to ask any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elsa. Um, so while we're waiting for some questions to come through, I, I have a couple of questions. I'm, I'm really, uh, I really enjoy seeing how uh, we could potentially use the uh, media loading as a biomarker to identify OA and progression of OA. Um, so one of the questions I have is, what, what do you think are the challenges in um, embedding such simulation in a clinical pathway? And what do we as engineers need to do and what we need to focus on to make that happen? Um, well, I kind of hinted to both um, the fact that we, uh, of course, cannot uh, put everyone through a gate analysis uh, assessment. Um, so we need to use more uh, sparse data sets or uh, low fidelity motion capture systems, which of course makes that we lose some of the sensitivity of the description of the gait pattern. And also we need to be able to work with um, 
musculoskeletal geometrical features that are of lower quality. So I think going from more low fidelity data to then the population-based characteristics and then into the musculoskeletal modeling workflow is something that is highly uh, needed. And then, of course, validation on a large uh, data, data set will, of course, be uh, the final uh, thing that needs to happen. Yeah, yeah, um, definitely. I think uh, collecting all of these um, detailed data set is quite challenging. Um, but yes, going going toward the stratified version of data set would be really um, what what might help with the data analysis and so on. Um, there is uh, one more question. Um, I think. Okay, so I'll leave that to be answered um, offline, that's all right. So we're gonna move on to, oh, and thank you very much, Elsa. Um, and uh, thank you very much for coming along and giving us your talk. It was really, really useful and really enjoyed it. Thank you. Um, so I'd like to invite our second speaker. Um, our second speaker is Dr. Eni Halilai. Um, she's an assistant professor at, in mechanical engineering in Carnegie Mellon University. She'll be talking about data-driven and hybrid approaches for rehabilitation monitoring with wearables. Over to you, Annie. Thanks, Rosti, for the introduction and for the invitation to speak here. And good afternoon, everyone. So I will start with a typical case study that motivates our work. So. This is an Olympic athlete tearing an ACL, one of the major ligaments uh, in the knee. The medical team for this athlete included a collaborator of mine, and with permission, we've obtained the patient's recovery trajectory. So here it is. At the age of 20, this patient had an ACL reconstruction surgery. At 23, he was diagnosed with early stage knee osteoarthritis, or OA. At 35, he, needed, uh, he had late stage knee OA. And by 40, he would have needed a knee replacement. Now, the challenge with getting a knee replacement this early in life is that knee implants are meant to last only about 10 to 15 years, and second surgeries are not as successful as initial uh, ones. So by 55, this patient will likely struggle to move and be independent. Now, not all patients who tear their ACL go on to develop knee OA, but about 60% of the, them do. So one of the questions that I and many others in the community ask is what makes clinical outcomes so vastly different in these patients? And can we intervene to make the 60% uh, more like the 40%? The degree of trauma sustained during the injury itself plays a role, but gait adaptation after the surgery is also important and it's a modifiable target. The challenge is that we don't have sufficient information on how gait adapts after the surgery to design effective personalized interventions and rehab protocols. So it's tough to know how patients are moving in natural environments, whether they're restoring their normal gait or if they're maladapting in order to avoid pain. So the standard approach we've been using until now to study movement involves bringing subjects in a research gait lab equipped with specialty cameras, placing retroreflective markers on anatomical landmarks, recording them while they move over treadmills or floors equipped with force plates, and then inputting the data into biomechanical models. Now, this approach has three main limitations. First, it's labor in intensive. Uh, second, it, it requires expensive equipment and trained engineers. So it's not scalable across clinics. And most importantly, movement can only be captured in a limited and highly controlled environment where patients are in their best behavior because they know they're being watched. In natural environments, they may be more alert to their pain and probably adopting pain avoidance strategies. Now, in the cardiovascular literature, there's plenty of evidence on the existence of the white coat syndrome, where patients have higher blood pressure uh, in the presence of a clinician. The same effect is not yet extensively documented in gait analysis, but there's at least one uh, recent paper that reported that as the number of researchers observing participants uh, in the gait lab increased, so did the participants' gait speed, cadence, and stride length. So for all of the reasons that I just mentioned, there's consensus and cautious excitement about moving the study of human movement biomechanics to natural environments. 
we are now at a turning point where wearable sensors and computer vision algorithms applied to videos from personal smartphone cameras could transform understanding of human movement and clinical care. So in the weeks when patients have to undergo physical therapy, they could be passively monitored with a camera in the clinic or with a smartphone at home and get feedback on exercise correctness, including coaching on how to improve. During daily life, their motion could be passively monitored with wearable sensors and either used to deliver real-time haptic feedback for gait correction or shared with clinicians to help them adapt physical therapy accordingly. So wearables are projected to close the loop between research and clinical practice and play a key role in precision rehabilitation, which is defined as the delivery of the right feedback to the right patient at the right time. So here are what I consider uh, three major scientific challenges toward precision rehab from a biomechanics perspective. The first one is that we need to better understand what biomechanical outcomes we can assess in natural environments. We are trained to interpret patient decline or recovery in terms of ranges of motion, joint angles, moments, loads, which we can measure in the lab, but not always with wearable sensors, at least not to an extent that is acceptable for many clinical applications. Inertial measurement units or IMUs, for example, measure acceleration and angular velocity, which we still have a hard time interpreting in the context of musculoskeletal health. So that prevents us from being able to provide the right type of feedback, even if we measure movement. The second challenge is that even if we could derive all the desired outcomes from wearable sensors, we would still not fully know what impact they have on specific patients because of the interaction between mechanics and biology. A classical example is that pro-inflammatory cytokines modulate the effect of loading on cartilage. So to better match load-modifying prescriptions with specific patients for desired clinical outcomes, we need to better understand these interactions. And the third challenge uh, is designing smart technologies that can effectively modulate feedback delivery when it matters. This involves questions around sensing, haptics, behavior change, and how to incorporate those components with knowledge of internal tissue response to external stimuli. So my research at Carnegie Mellon focuses around these three challenges, and today I wanted to briefly share some highlights from our work in the first area. So motion tracking with videos and IMUs, and how we're trying to extract meaning meaningful biomechanical outcomes from these technologies. Now, when we think of wearables and videos, deep learning comes to mind as a major tool that's driving data analytics, but deep learning thrives on big data. Given that we still don't have this large wearable data sets in biomechanics, my group has been using three approaches to improve the accuracy of these models. The first one is to fuse data from complementary modalities like videos and inertial sensing. The second one is to fuse complementary methods like deep learning, which is data-driven, and biomechanical modeling, which is physics-based. And last, we have explored learning from synthetic data. And I'll briefly tell you about each of these uh, three approaches. So the way computer vision for motion tracking works is typically through a neural network that's been trained on thousands of human annotated images. Given any new image of a human, these neural nets can detect joint centers in 2D or 3D if we have multiple videos and triangulate them. Now, because we're often interested in 3D motion, we can fit parametric deformable statistical meshes of the human body to these joint centers. Uh, these are fit through top-down optimization, where the loss function minimizes the distance between the joint centers of the mesh and the joint centers from the image detected with a neural net. Now, these methods are improving rapidly. They're even being used in the World Cup currently, but they're not accurate enough for many clinical applications, especially if we wanted to use a reduced number of cameras. So we wondered if we could use data from skin-worn IMUs to refine the solution, since videos usually suffer from occlusion, which IMUs can help correct, whereas IMUs suffer from drift, which the videos can help correct. So to do this, we added an additional term to the loss function that minimized the distance between the synthetic angular velocities from the mesh fitting and the true angular velocities from the body-worn IMUs. 
So to test this approach, we collected data inside this Panoptic studio with 31 high definition cameras, 10 Kinect sensors, and nearly 500 VGA cameras, uh, while participants also wore full body IMUs. The reason for this excessively sensorized setup is to enable collection of lots of ground truth motion capture data really fast without the need for markers as we do in traditional gate lab. And given this ground truth motion, we can now test how tracking with a smart set of sensors or cameras, including a single smartphone camera, compares to the ground truth. So here's a short clip uh, from the data collection where you can see the joint center uh, detection model that uses the entire camera set followed by the 3D mesh um, fit to those joint centers, which is further uh, enhanced through the use of full body IMUs. So we looked at motion reconstruction with up to 25 randomly selected cameras. Uh, and here are the results. In red, we have the root mean squared error from the video only solution. And in blue, fusion of videos and IMUs, the X axis is the number of cameras. When we add IMU data as expected, accuracy improves, but not to the extent that we'd like. Now, as I mentioned, computer vision models are data driven and the proposed solutions are not constrained to satisfy the equations of motion. So we wondered if dynamic optimization, one under which the solution obeys the laws of physics, the equations of motion in this case, would be better than unconstrained optimization. And after systematically running simulations on data with different noise levels, we found that dynamic optimization does help, especially when the quality of the inertial data is affected by noise, such as soft tissue motion. So here are the results from an example experiment using eight cameras. And compared to video-based solutions alone, we're getting significant improvements when we fuse the data uh, with dynamic optimization. And these improvements were more salient than what we saw with unconstrained optimization. The caveat here is that we started with a 2D biomechanical model. So next, we're trying to verify these results with 3D biomechanical models. So the ultimate goal uh, is to build open source tools to drive biomechanical models using data from videos, IMUs, and a combination of the two. Note that these biomechanical models uh, have until now required laboratory data. Uh, given a mesh from vision-based solutions, we are trying to automatically identify a virtual mar marker set from the mesh that mimics the markers that we collect in gate labs and then run inverse kinematics and inverse dynamics using the biomechanical model that is physiologically constrained. So in the example that you're seeing right now, the biomechanical model is entirely being driven using data from the videos. Okay, so in addition uh, to using complementary modalities and methods, the third approach to improving motion tracking with wearables is to use synthetic data. What we've done in the past is to pool large data sets with ground truth motion capture from different labs and use this data to create synthetic inertial or video data from which we've, we've then trained deep learning models for the 3D motion tracking. And there's three takeaways from our work with synthetic data. First, if we look at learning curves, how the accuracy of these deep learning models improves with more data, we see that we have not reached the point where adding more data doesn't make a significant difference anymore. So it's not always the case that more data are better for machine learning models, but in biomechanics, it still is. So it means that our field is still uh, data poor. The second is that modeling noise and sensor miscalibration errors in the synthetic data, so augmenting the data to account for these variabilities, has a huge impact on model performance. For example, the accuracy of joint kinematics remains under 4 degrees, despite sensor misplacement errors of up to 20 and even 30 degrees in some of our simulations. So this is important because sensor misplacement is one of the main sources of error when patients take the sensors home and apply them themselves uh, over multiple days. And last, models trained on synthetic data do generalize to real data. So here's an example of a model we trained to predict how the knee adduction moment would change if patients learned a new gait. The x-axis is a model prediction and the y-axis is a ground truth. 
The gray points represent the synthetic data on which the model was trained, while the blue represent the real data collected in our motion capture lab at Carnegie Mellon on which the model was tested. So the reduction in accuracy when the model is applied to real data is both statistically insignificant and clinically not meaningful. So that's a brief overview of the approaches that we're using to tackle motion tracking with wearables and to democratize gait analysis for patients and clinicians. This is work that I'm doing with my students at Carnegie Mellon and collaborators across institutions. So I wanted to thank them and my funding sources and thank you for listening. Also, here's my email if you wanted to follow up after uh, the webinar. And thanks again. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Annie. Um, it's a lovely seeing your, your research, um, especially in detail. I haven't, uh, haven't seen your talk before, so this is the first time uh, learning about what you're doing. Okay, so we have a couple of questions coming through, uh, but before I, um, I ask those questions, I have one question for you. So um, we talk about uh, more data, therefore it's, it's going to be better for, in terms for, for the biomechanics study. Uh, but we, we, we don't talk about error progression and how does error progression affect synthetic data. Did you, did you look at that or what, what, what is your finding if you've looked at it before? By error progression, do you mean how the error changes with more data? Yeah, so you, uh, if, you, if we collect data from different devices, uh, we expect different data sets, but then those, those can be counted as error. But then would they, when you collect those data and put them in musculoskeletal modeling, are this error progressed equally or are they differently progressed or have you looked at it before? So the... the plot that I had in one of the prior slides when I talked about more data. So here, when I'm talking about more data, I'm basically referring to deep learning, not so much biomechanical modeling. So um, we have plotted learning curves and looking at how error changes with more data. And because that curve is not plateauing, that tells us that more data will help us uh, keep improving these models. Yeah, okay. If I understood um, your question. No, no, I think I think so. Maybe, maybe um, yeah, I was I was thinking of it more of a, a more detailed data set, which is I think linking back to the next question I have, um, and it's about how how accurate for translation this method is for translation, especially for looking at um, total knee replacement or post ACL reconstruction and so on. Yeah, so how accurate would these methods need to be for translation? That, that's a very good question. I, I don't think there's a threshold. I think different ap applications will have different needs. So our, our job, I think, as engineers is to present all. So this is the accuracy of the, uh, of the models, right? If you have this many cameras, if you have this many sensors, and if you're using this method, this is the error to tolerance. Um, uh, this is the error of... of our methods, and then you have to compare that with the error to to tolerance of the application. So I think uh, this is where it's important for engineers to work together with clinicians to kind of match which methods are more applicable for a given application. So for applications that need higher accuracy, I would recommend using more cameras, a combination of cameras and IMUs, but for applications uh, that don't need such high accuracy, you can get away with uh, maybe two cameras. So uh, that's where it's important to kind of present how, how accuracy changes uh, with different sensor densities. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you so much, Annie. Um, and it was lovely um, seeing your talk again. Thank you for coming along today. Oh, thank you. Um, I'm going to uh, move on to the next talk. So can I invite Professor Alex Franji? Um, uh, Professor Alex Franji, he is a Diamond Jubilee Chair of Co Computational Medicine and Royal Academy of Engineering Chair in Emerging Technologies at the University of Leeds. And he'll be talking about in silico regulatory science and innovation, safer, better and cheaper devices. Over to you, Alex. Hello. Can you, can you hear me well, Rosti? Yes, I can. Yes. And I can see you. <clears throat> Let me check if I can. Uh, 
You should be able to see the presentation now. Yeah. yeah thank you. Super. <clears throat> so thanks a lot for the introduction, Rusty. And <clears throat> this talk is um, a bit more like an overview talk and to provide the motivation for why in silico methods could be useful in the regulatory space <clears throat> rather than going into a detail into a specific piece of research. So what I hope um, uh, you will gather from, from this talk is, is the following three points. Um, so first, why do we need regulatory science and why um, you know, we as engineers should bother about this aspect that sounds more like other type of sciences. Um, so regulatory science uh, is basically the both acquisition and analysis of data that is required for taking decisions in the context of regulatory approval process, but is also the science of developing tools, standards, and methods to allow us to assess the safety and efficacy of medical products. Uh, and in doing so, assess their quality and, and their performance. Um, so in the process of regula regula regulations, what fundamentally we, are, we have to do is to provide scientific evidence. Um, current uh, regulatory um, approval processes take primarily three sources of scientific evidence. One is bench studies. The other one is animal data from, from animal uh, experimentation. And of course, uh, human studies in various forms, the most um, advance of which is a randomized control trial, so clinical trials. What in silico regulatory science advocates is <clears throat> the need to add a fourth dimension to all of those three. So it's not about completely eliminating those other methods, they will still remain important, but add a fourth dimension of scientific evidence, which is based on computation and modeling and simulation or in silico as, as a counterpart to in vivo, in vitro um, approaches. So why this is important? Well, uh, the implants file study that was uh, an investigative journalist study done a few years ago, demonstrated that across a very large range of devices uh, over a period of 10 years in the US alone, there was over 83,000 deaths that were associated directly with malfunction of medical devices. And also over a million, uh, 1.7 million that were serious adverse effects of similar nature. And all of those are connected to devices that went all the way through the regulatory approval process. Now, as technologies become more and more complex and we are getting more sophisticated devices incorporating met, you know, um, hardware, uh, software, and chemistry sometimes in various forms, um, that becomes only more and more, and more complex and the limitations of our current regulatory system become only more, more obvious. The, apart from the serious adverse effects to patients um, and the fact that you know, there is inevitable consequences to animals from this way of, of approaching um, the generation of evidence, there is also a large sector trust that is hindered every time there is a failure. People are, uh, say that about 10%, the, the a company that has a recall from a medical device their shares on average reduce by 10% their value the day after the recall has taken place. And also that increases the R&D cost and also the time to market for potentially very successful technologies that now have to go through a very complex process of regulatory approval. If you also look at the statistics over the last 20 years, uh, the growth of the medical device and the pharma sector is about five to 6% year on year compound annual growth rates. However, if you look at the regulatory output from say FDA approvals on both drugs and devices is completely flat uh, for the last 20 years. In addition, this has massive implications um, for costs for companies. So here to give a, a concrete example, so this is a, a, a particular um, a trial from a randomized control trial from um, an imaging manufacturer that uh, for a medical device manufacturer that is providing uh, TAVIS or transcatheter aortic valve implantations. Uh, this particular trial, uh, if you go to the stats of it, it cost it took about 80 million in just the, running the trial alone, six to nine years of uh, before this between design and 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 um, publication of the results. And when the device was taken out of the market in November two years ago, 
this impacted only two to 300 million losses for the company. And this is just one particular device of a very large gamut of devices for one particular uh, disease. So as you can um, imagine, this is something that is very, very unsustainable because all of these costs eventually roll into our healthcare systems and we end up paying them. So the value proposition of in silico trials is, can we actually reduce from years to months and also fail earlier and faster and in, that, in doing so, um, you know, have better um, devices and, and less harm to both um, patients and, and animal welfare. And this is a technology that can affect, you know, different phases of the life cycle of a medical product. Now, as mechanical engineers, and, and this is, a, is a, a slide that I usually use when I talk about this to clinicians, uh, but for you, for you, it's going to be absolutely heavy then that we've been doing this for the last 30, 40 years in the automotive industry, aerospace, uh, you name it, right? Uh, and the important thing is that we have not only improved the products of this process, of this, uh, in this sector, but also um, improved the processes by which we develop this product. So we don't tend to use wind tunnels so often, we use aerodynamic simulations, we do less physical crash tests, we can do them in simulations. And we're even talking about, you know, virtual, we talk about virtual prototyping and even about self-driving cars in the future. So all the underlying technologies for industry 4.0 that are very obvious in other sectors, they still need to happen more in the medical device. And let's know that this device is about four times larger than the medical device sector. So it's not hugely bigger. So in, in, in an area that I work very closely, which is not musculoskeletal, but cardiovascular over the last 20 years, Flow diversion devices for brain aneurysms remain fundamentally a bunch of wires, and we still have 20% complication rate, 3% mortality rate. And we could do very similar things that we do as in the automotive industry, as I explained before. So what <clears throat> in silico trials is all about is about reducing, refining, and replacing the need of conventional trials by a transition to, let's call it, industry 4.0 in this area, where we reduce the amount of animal and bench testing and human testing by reducing them to those that actually are really necessary and where we can sift technologies and ideas and, and designs much earlier on through modeling and simulation. Uh, my view is that in the future, animal and bench testing will be more useful to inform computational models and validate them that necessarily as a precursor of a condition of a situation in, in humans, while we will use um, virtual um, uh, patients and digital twins type of technologies to create virtual populations and equivalent to conventional trials. So what do you need to actually develop those in silico trials? Fundamentally, three main areas require work. This is just a very high level view. How you create virtual patients and virtual populations from large data sets, and the previous talk was given some of, um, um, let's say, um, data from, from patients to create, from real world evidence more generally, to actually create virtual populations. Then we also need to be able to simulate both the interventions, if we are talking about uh, therapies or uh, examinations, if we talk about diagnostics, and then we need to have mechanisms to do virtual readouts from those uh, imaging or, or implant systems or other types of technologies and also virtual outcomes. Because most of the times the outcomes we are able to measure through modeling and simulation are more mechanistic and not necessarily related with things like pain or death or some of the other quality of life, which is a typical uh, outcome measures that are used in, con in conventional um, trials. So you need to develop surrogate endpoints, which are technical, that are used to the predictions potentially of clinical endpoints. So how this all works together? So you have um, lab libraries of um, a particular organ of interest. You can, uh, in those, um, imagine implanting the particular device, looking at variables, physical variables, uh, like Ilse was talking before. In this case, hemodynamics, you can also look at different physiological regimes and some of the previous talks were very nice in showing how you can incorporate physics in boundary conditions and in sort of uh, lifestyle type of variables. They also are relevant here. And of course, you can then is explore a completely uh, a new set of, of designs. So just to give you some very quick uh, examples, like one slide, each of them, two or three of them, 
um, that show this general point that in silico trials actually add depth and nuance to conventional randomized control trials as a gold standard. So uh, we have virtual populations, as I mentioned before, that we can utilize. And um, FDA, for instance, has been developing uh, in silico trials for digital breast thermosynthesis, comparing it with the standard of practice, and where they have published results showing what I uh, utilize or reuse in my title, uh, that you know these techniques allow us for cheaper, faster, better, safer, and even more scalable uh, in, uh, conventional trials. Uh, MHRA, and I put those two examples intentionally to show you two regulators already working in this space. MHRA in the UK looking at generating high fidelity synthetic data, which is another way to talk about potentially uh, patient, uh, virtual patients um, that can be utilized in this case to, to train machine learning algorithms. More close to your uh, domain here of musculoskeletal or orthopedics, uh, companies like Simmer Biomed have been utilizing and publishing work on, util on, on experimental on using modeling and simulation to replace experimental uh, preclinical testing uh, in conditions which are more closer to uh, population data as opposed to you know, something that you program in a, in, a, in a physical simulator. And more recently, a group in Bath also had a very interesting paper where they utilized um, in silico trials uh, to uh, look into a combination of device with uh, surgical uh, therapy, osteostomy. And this is again together with um, a company in the sector. And then in our group, uh, we've done quite a lot of work with flow diversion devices where we demonstrated that in silico trials were useful to expand the insights from conventional trials, uh, not just to replicate the results. And we could explain failure modes of the device that were, would be impossible or unethical to do with a conventional trial. So what I'm saying is that this seems to be ready for prime time. And just to, to highlight both the, the yes part of that point and, and the no part, um, FDA, uh, the European medicine agencies, and more recently MHRA have working in various um, ways to understand these technologies. And in particular, FDA is quite ahead with a lot of guidance uh, being even written and even standards like ASME B and B40, which are validation and verification standards for modeling and simulation. Uh, a week ago or 10 days ago, FDA, as if it wasn't enough with everything that they've done before, they published a very interesting document with 14 case studies of using modeling and simulation within FDA over the last five years, uh, trying to convey to industry and to scientists that this is something they're genuinely committed to. Um, and then in terms of what are the limitations or what are the areas that the various. So um, we undertook a few months ago um, a survey to the community with about 300 uh, participants where we asked them to identify the five top barriers for the adoption of in silico trials. And the top three barriers were the regulatory acceptance uncertainty. Uh, so are the regulators going to accept this evidence or not? And I think documents like FDA's ones last week are very important in conveying trust and com confidence on those, but also the need for more mature and credible models and the need for us as scientists to develop better validation uh, and verification tests of our models that we propose, um, and also to develop models in areas where perhaps there is less maturity of those. And then finally, the importance of raising the awareness and, and, and develop further skills in regulators about how to interpret results from modeling and simulation. I'm going to skip this bit, but um, so just to summarize, um, I don't think the current status quo is an option, so we will really see those more and more often. And I think in the future, we will see the use of modeling and simulation as a way to provide innovations that are more responsible and patient sparing in, in a way that also combine the desire for certainty in the device performance with also the fact of limiting the delay in getting to the in getting new technologies that could be life savings to the market and to patients. And we believe that modeling and simulation is part of the key to that. And if you're interested in knowing more about this, um, there is a number of sources that I can point you out. The insilicouk.org webpage uh, provides a community that is over 1,500 people at the moment with a Slack workspace. There is a roadmap that is being drafted, that is being evaluated at the moment. And if you join, you will get access to it. 
Um, also, Avicen Alliance, which uh, which is more at the European, operating at the European level, and um, this work we are doing it also in close collaboration with the Virtual Physiological Human Institute uh, chapter, particularly in the UK, but also uh, more broad, broadly across Europe. And I hope this is useful. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alex. Uh, this was very interesting. Um, as, as a simulation person, I'm always very excited to hear talks about um, promoting ear simulations and modeling. And uh, I think particularly the talk when you said uh, we need to learn from automotive industry and, and then apply this methodology for product development and increasing safety um, uh, in biomedical engineering is important. So. Um, that was a really good point to take on, um, especially for our attendees who are not necessarily biomedical engineers, they're mechanical engineers. So we need we need to learn from automotive industry and uh, to make the products we develop in safer, uh, but using simulation as well. So I have a couple of questions coming through. Um, uh, one is uh, from Richard uh, from Imperial College, and he's asking, I see the value for iterative tech development could this ever be replaced it could could this ever replace the need for physical validation for a paradigm shift in technology where there is no prior clinical data no that's a that's a very good point i think um the the, the part where there is the biggest saving in terms of time and effort is really the clinical trials more than the preclinical testing necessarily but um I think you will always need some experiments informing models and then models informing the next round of experiments that are required. So I hope I didn't come across as dismissing the importance of experiments because that's not the case. Um, but what I think is that um, at the moment, we could be more guided in the experiments we do if we, if we understood what are the big questions that need to be addressed. And I don't have time now to go through some examples, but we have found examples where um, you see a huge amount of development in industry on improving devices in areas that perhaps are not the most critical items. Uh, when you when you look at this more more um, when you can explore a population more thoroughly in this way. Um, on the other hand, the the idea is that you can essentially you can narrow down um, the need for experiments, particularly in humans. Uh, with technologies that you could prove through simulation and through basic physics that they're potentially harmful or, or as a minimum, not very helpful. Thank you. Um, and the last question, um, it's from Diego. He's asking, regulation progress is cumbersome, often, la often lags technology, even in established fields. How can we change the framework to keep up with the pace of computational developments? That's a very good point. Well, um, join us in this in Silico UK network because what we are trying to do is collectively that, and there is no one single answer uh, to that question. But one of the answers is by creating more um, success stories, like these case studies that I show. If you are aware of, if anybody in the community is aware of a case study um, that I haven't presented, please send me an email because I'm keen to showcase those. The second is we are writing at the moment a roadmap, a landscape document that will be uh, ready in early January. And we need more people to help us review it. Um, so that will be a document that we'll put to government. We're also talking directly with regulators um, and basically is is help to, to raise awareness and, and, and you know make these technologies some, and, and a more thorough engineering approach to the development of evidence uh, something that that uh, you know is more is more commonplace. So it's a bit of of dissemination work, as I hope I'm trying to do today as well in this webinar. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Alex, and thank you so much for giving us your time and um, answering the questions as well. Thank you. Um, so I would like to thank all speakers in both sessions and thank you very much for coming along and thank you for asking the questions and answering them. Um, and this video will be available um, and uh, thank you for attending once more. We'll be interested soon. Goodbye.